everybody. Scott Kaviton. Uh, so excited to be here. I just, so far this morning, I don't know about everybody else, we're going into lunch, and so your tummies are probably grumbling here a little bit, but I don't know about you, but this is the most energizing day ever. And, I, and, and when Rennie, he's around here somewhere, there he is. When Rennie asked me to do this, um, you know, I wasn't sure what I would talk about. And I've been lucky enough over the last you know, 15 years to, to be active in a lot of different communities around technology, specifically uh, open, mobile, and social. And when I heard that the theme was Crossroads, I thought, wow, that's, I think that's a great theme, and Portland's such a perfect place for that. Um, but what I realized is when I, when I started thinking about where we're at with open, mobile, and social, it was really you know, a collision. And so, so today, I want to talk about how we got to where we are today um, and, and do a little history lesson and then talk about some of the, the what I think are some of the most impactful things that are happening right now. Um, now I'm going to do a tech demo. I'm going to fail because they never work when you do them. Um, but to prove a point, um, here we are, you know, uh, most of you probably uh, before you left, you know, you, you, you picked up your phone, you checked Google Maps to see what the traffic was going to be like. Maybe you looked at the weather. You probably just looked out the window to do that. But I'm going to take a quick picture here. And, and to sort of prove a point, um, I'm going to upload this onto, I'm the guy who's like checking his email on stage, by the way. Um, <laughs> totally not, totally not. Uh, but to make a point, I, I'm going to upload this picture to, uh, to Instagram. I, uh, seriously, it's OK. I'm going to do this. It's going to work. OK. I'm going to pick a place where I'm at. I'm at the Girding Theater. I'm going to post this on Facebook and Twitter. And I've just taken this picture, and I've uploaded it to the internet, just like that. And it worked. totally worked. You can see it on there. <clears throat> I even put a filter on it. Um, so what's amazing about this is this just went out to you know, the followers that I have. It went out to Twitter, and there's several thousand followers there, and, and, and a bunch of folks on Facebook. And from there, people will then uh, uh, share that or comment on it in real time, right? And to think about you know, where we've been at technology you know, for the last 20 years, you know, browsing or doing anything on the internet was an activity. Now you participate in this thing. You take this computer everywhere you go. And you know, being able to do that, you couldn't even do what I just did three years ago, four years ago. Um, and it's having a huge, huge effect on, on everything. So to start things off, I want to talk about open. And to talk about open, you have to talk about this guy first. Um, this is Richard Stallman. And he's just as goofy looking in person as, as he is on that, in that picture. And he is um, he's, he's, he's a goof. Uh, the guy travels with his own mattress, like through airports. I'm not kidding. He, he, he you know, he... He gets food in his beard, and he'll pick it out and eat it. And, but he's, he's one of the most principled people I've ever seen in industry. And in 1982, he got really, really frustrated as you know, being part of the MIT hacker culture. These are people who were building software, writing code, sharing, and creating uh, like you'd never seen before. Um, Big business was building these computers that wouldn't ship the source code. In other words, they just had the program. So you couldn't get in there and hack on it. And so in 1985, he founded what was called the Free Software Foundation. And, and part of it was to create a set of licenses that were essentially the rules of engagement for creating software. Um, and more importantly, free software. Uh, so open software that could be shared, that could be uh, uh, you know, changed, implemented, uh, uh, and, and you know, really grown. Um, so in 1991, uh, a 21-year-old uh, Finnish master's student sent this email. Uh, he's just working on a little hobby um, to create a, an operating system. He had a PC at home. You know, in the back of the day, these were like 386s, so these big boxes. And uh, he wanted to create this, this OS. And he was like, I'm just going to do this as a hobby. Um, and you know, a lot of us know who this is. This is Linus Torvalds. He actually lives here in Portland. Um, and he created Linux. And when it came time for him to think about how he was going to spread the word and how he was going to create sort of a meritocracy around it, he adopted those licenses that Richard Stallman had created. That was a huge, huge deal. And, and although you don't know it, and I'll talk about it more in a second, uh, Linux is everywhere. It's in a lot of your pockets. It's powering cars. It's doing all kinds of different things. And it's created by a group of people who share code uh, in, in just an amazing way. Um, but then there's other kinds of open, right? This is Julian Assange. And uh, you know, folks have seen Wikipedia. 
And this is WikiLeaks. He, he's the guy who founded WikiLeaks. And in 2006, he founded it really with wanting to promote and, and, and force transparency at the government level. Um, in, on November 28th of 2010, not but five months ago, uh, WikiLeaks released 251,000 U.S. diplomatic cables, um, ranging anywhere from uh, unclassified all the way to secret. This one was from August 2008 from the U.S. Embassy uh, back uh, uh, to the U.S. <clears throat> and it basically talked about in Tunisia, you know, we've, we've got this discontent that's largely beneath the surface, right? You know, it, it was when this came out and when this was released in November, the Western press didn't really pick it up. But in Tunisia, there was a lot of discussion that would, you know, sort of came from this. I'll talk more about that in a second. <clears throat> so the next piece is mobile. And, you know, uh, uh, Dave actually had one of these earlier. But, you know, it, it started at this, but this is the important fact. There's four billion mobile devices on the planet. That's one for every two people on the planet. And, you know, to give you an idea, there's 900 million PCs on the planet. To give you another idea, um, Facebook has 600 million users. A third of those have never used a computer. They only access it through their phone. So this is a huge, huge thing that's happening. <clears throat> In 2003, Andy Rubin came along with a couple colleagues, and they decided, you're going to hear another theme here, to create an, an operating system for mobile phones. Uh, and they based it on, you know, you guessed it, Linux. And they based it on the work of Richard Stallman in this open sharing of, of, of code to create a better operating system for these devices. They created Android. Uh, it got purchased by Google. And now Android today, uh, uh, Linux is on all of these devices. So these projects that have been happening over the years are now 600,000 of these new phones are being activated every single day. So open and mobile are, are intrinsically tied. And then, of course, you can't talk about phones without talking about Steve Jobs. Um, and in 2007, of course, they released the iPhone. And what was interesting about the iPhone was this wasn't just a phone for voice or, or text. This was a platform for creation. So this was a place for you to, to build a business around what this phone could do. It knows who you are. It knows where you are. It knows who your friends are. Uh, and out of it, we saw some of the most amazing applications um, that are really changing the face of the earth. So social is one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, and we've been here before. I don't know how many people even have a Friendster account or a MySpace account. <laughs> but sort of, I, I look at it as sort of like, you know, we had version 1.0 and we had version 2.0. Um, and, uh, you know, it wasn't quite there. And so, so what, what was different this time? Um, and I'll never forget, I, had, uh, I have a, a good friend of mine, uh, his name is Chris Messina, and he's a, an open source activist, free thinker, um, ironically works at Google. Um, <laughs> I'm sure he's watching this right now and about to just give me grief. But um, I'll never forget a dinner I had with him in December of 2006. And uh, it was a bunch of tech folks, and I was down in, in San Francisco, and we went out, and there was probably 12 of us. So it kind of takes, it's a pain to get seated, okay? So we get seated, and then everybody like goes like this, down into their phone. And this is 2006, this is pre-iPhone, right? Then even, you know, the iPhone was sort of a rumor at the time. And uh, uh, I'm like, what the fuck, are you, what are you guys all doing, right? And, and he looks up and he said, we're Twittering. And I'm like, you know, what, what, come on, what is Twitter, right? So I immediately sign up. And uh, that's, my, <laughs> that's my first tweet. It's amazing. You can still find your first, your, your first tweets. And what's, what's really funny is this was the first experience for everybody with Twitter. It was like, why the hell am I doing this? Almost everyone's first tweet is, I don't get it. <clears throat> I didn't tweet again for six months, um, which was funny. But, but what's, what's interesting, what's powerful, I think, about Twitter is the fact that um, it took advantage. You know, the website was a joke. You didn't use the website. You, you'd use your phone. And it used the simplest of features. The reason you can only have 140 characters on, uh, on Twitter is because of that you know, SMS limitation. Um, it's not because they wanted you know, everybody to be really pithy in you know, short, <laughs> short, <laughs> short bites. Um, but you know, it, it's amazing to see how it took off. And, and it started in the Bay Area. So it was actually physical, real, personal connections of people. In, in a, and it got to a high enough density that was able to sort of you know, spread to other places. You know, we saw this with Facebook, too. 
uh, you know, love him or hate him, uh, he, he did start at Harvard, and then they went to the Ivy League schools, and then all of higher education. And then from there, they were able to, to go even further. And, and I remember going to New York and uh, in August of 2009 and, and visiting with Naveen. He's one of the co-founders of uh, Foursquare. And they said, yeah, when we launched the company, we just focused on restaurants and bars below 14th Street. That's it. Right? So, and, and sure enough, that night I went out, you know, and, and you know, it's New York, so you're gonna go out drinking. And sure enough, there's, there's all these restaurants, and they have chalkboards with the day's special. And sure enough, you know, scratched out on that chalkboard, today's mayor is so and so. And, and that was when I was like, oh my gosh, like I get it. Like people are like psyched, you know, they're coming in and checking in, even if they're not getting a drink. And then, then the restaurants were doing things like, hey, the mayor gets a half, you know, gets the first drink free for happy hour and all those kinds of things. So it was really clear that um, something interesting was happening there. Um, so, you know, here we are today uh, with this crazy collision of open, mobile, and social. And, and more importantly, December 17th was. 30 plus years after uh, Richard Stallman started his movement, 20 years after Linux got going, uh, you know, eight years after Android, six years after YouTube, Facebook, uh, and Twitter, and just 19 days after the diplomatic cables were released. <coughs> so Mohammed Bouazizi started December 17th like he did every day. He was a, a vegetable cart. He ran an unlicensed vegetable cart. He was a sole, um, sole earner for his family of eight. And he lived in Tunisia. And uh, on that day, a policewoman approached him and confiscated his cart. And he, you know, he protested and he said, hey, well, I'll pay you the, the fine, it's like 50 dinar, like $7 a day's wage. And uh, he, um, she said no. She slapped him in the, in the face, she spit on him, and she insulted his dead father. And, uh, so he, he was enraged and he went down to the local municipality office and uh, he, you know, he demanded an audience and they didn't give it to him. Without telling his family and within an hour at 11.30 in the morning, he returned. He doused himself in gasoline and lit himself on fire. The protests that ensued, they were peaceful and they were crushed by the Tunisian forces. It's, it's amazing to, to think that that's how it happened, but it did. The Western media did not cover it at all. But it didn't matter, <laughs> because open, mobile, and social were happening. And like wildfire on Facebook, videos on YouTube, Twitter, SMS, this revolution spread not only through Tunisia and toppled these regimes that had been in power for years, it spread all across the Middle East. This is a map that Slate did of the ongoing uh, uh, you know, things that are happening right now. And it's amazing to think that you know, even five years ago, these folks, you know, these Egyptian activists, wouldn't be able to say Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube because they didn't exist. So today, you know, when you're, when you're uh, uh, checking in on Foursquare or, or you're um, you know, Twittering or, or on Facebook or whatever, you know, take a minute to think about how different the world is. Um, and for me, you know, I, I think about it as the printing press. Um, this is way bigger than the printing press. It's gonna take generations for us to, to understand the impact of all of this. But you know, like I said, you know, the next time you check in on, on Foursquare, you know, think about what a brave new world uh, we're living in. So thank you.